Before I came to Linwood, I was in uh, Corbin, Kentucky, and I spent most, I grew up there and um, was there at a church for 12 and a half years, loved my ministry there, loved what God did in my life there, and at one point, he allowed me to be a football coach, and for those of you that know me, I love football, and it's football season. My girls yesterday uh, wanted to watch TV, and I said, well, it depends on what football game's on, and they all went, why do you like to watch football, Dad? I said, because it's football season. So I, I love football, and um, I was a, a middle school coach, a 7th and 8th grade coach for seven years, and uh, the, the coach that I got, the head coach there uh, was on staff at the school and allowed me, asked me to be a part of his staff, and, and I, I just, I loved coaching football, and uh, played in, in high school and in college, and uh, was able to, uh, to coach for seven years, and I loved that part of coaching. But there was a part of coaching uh, that was tough, and it, it, this applies to any sport. But in coaching, we would get the kids and we would, we would coach them on what to do. Here's what you do when this man lines up here. Here's what to do on this play. And, and, and as a coach, you could tell them what to do. You could, you could show them where to go, how to do it. But then game time came, and we had to, as coaches, we had to stay back on the sideline, and it was up to the players to then go and execute. It was up to them to then go and do what they have been coached, what they have been asked to do. It was all on them. And there were times on the sideline, I was an intense coach. And I, I, um, I yelled and screamed. I, I yelled at them when they did wrong. And I screamed at them when they did great. And uh, I tried to balance that out. But there was a point where the, it was completely out of my control. It was all up to them. It was all on them. And this morning, uh, I want to look at a, a passage of Scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, and I feel like in this passage of Scripture, we're going to see where God has done His part. God does His part in our lives in salvation. But there comes a point and a time where it, it's all on us. It's on us. He gives us our part that we are to do. And, and so this morning, I want to uh, share that passage of Scripture with you and look at God's part and our part. And um, so if you have your scriptures with us, we're going to read verses 1 through 10 in 2 Peter chapter 1. It begins and says, Simon Peter, a slave and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. By these He has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these, th do these things, you will never stumble. So in this passage of Scripture, we see God's part and we see our part. But there's a couple things that I want to point out. Before we get into that, it's kind of a side note that I just can't help but, but look at. So if you look at me with me in verse 1, um, Peter, we got to remember who Peter was, right? Peter was the fisherman. Peter was the one who walked on water. He was the one who said he'd never uh, forsake Jesus. He'd never leave Jesus. He would die for Jesus. Uh, and then we see that Peter was the one who did deny him three times. Peter... Uh, was one of the apostles. He walked with Christ. He was one of the ones uh, that got to go up on the mountain of transfiguration and, and was there with Jesus when he was transfigured. And so this was Peter. And Peter says he's a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained a faith of equal privilege with ours. 
You know, sometimes we think that there's levels of faith. We think that, you know, Billy Graham has a certain level. Mother Teresa had a certain level of faith in Jesus. That, that God has given them, you know, they're up on this level and, and us, sometimes we're down here. And sometimes uh, people uh, put pastors and, and church leaders, they have a certain faith. They have a certain level. They're, they're at this level with God up here and everybody else is down here. Well, that's not what Peter says. Peter says that we have a faith of equal privilege with his. And if we have, a, if all of us, he's talking to all of us who are believers, if we have an equal privilege uh, as Peter does, we're all on the same level. And I don't know about you, but that, that reassures me that all of us are on the same playing field with God. That our faith, our level of faith is the same no matter who we are. We just have a different, a lot of us have a different calling different jobs that God has given us to do. The other side thing that I want to show you is at the end of verse 1. He says, An equal privilege with ours through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of people out there who don't believe Jesus was God. We, there's a lot of people out there who claim he was, he was just God's son. Jehovah's Witnesses claim that Jesus really wasn't God. He, he, was, he was God's son, and, and he wasn't equal with God. But Peter here very clearly references Jesus Christ as God, God and Savior. And so those are two things that I just couldn't help but point out to you this morning. I don't know if that encourages you or uh, if, if that was for you, but I couldn't help but, but, but point those out this morning. So jump down with me in verse 3. His divine power. Who's divine power? It's a reference back to Jesus. Jesus' divine power. If you remember all the things that Jesus' power did. Jesus healed people. Jesus raised people from the dead. Jesus uh, healed the blind, healed the lame. Uh, Jesus walked on water. Jesus calmed the storm. This same power that, that Jesus had, this power that Jesus had, this supernatural power, His divine power has given us, all believers, has given you and I everything. Everything. Not just a little bit here or just a little of this or a little of that, but it has given us everything required for life and godliness. He may not give us everything that we want, but he gives us everything that we need. He has given us everything required for life. What life? Well, the abundant life. Jesus said in John 10, 10 that I have come, or the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and, ab and more abundance. Jesus has given us life. He's given us everything that we need for that abundant life. He's also given us everything that we need in our physical life. He's, he meets our needs. Um, Matthew 6, 33 says that seek first, the righteousness of, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, that God is going to provide for us everything that we need for our physical life, but also for eternal life. God, Jesus has given us everything that we need for eternal life. He died on the cross for our sins, that we might be forgiven, that we might have that relationship with God, that we might be the people that he's called us to and know that heaven will be our home when we die. Jesus has given us everything required for life and godliness. I mean, a lot of times we think of godliness as just acting like God or, or having the characteristics of God and doing everything right. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment uh, and kind of change our idea of what we think godliness is. But he's given us everything that we need, everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory, through the knowledge of Christ. So that's God's part. God has done his part. He's given us everything that we need, everything that is required for us to be the people that he's called us to be. He's given you everything that you need to be who God has called you to be, whatever, whatever profession, whatever area of life, whatever it is that God has called you to be, whether it's a stay-at-home mom or whether it's the president of an organization, God has given you everything that you need for life and godliness. So what's our part? That's God's part. What's our part? Verse 5. For this very reason. What very reason? The reason that he just mentioned, the reason that he's, he's given us all of these, it's a reference back to verse 3, that he's given us everything that we need. So because of that, for that very reason, make every effort. 
You know, as a football coach, when I told our student, when I told our players, man, you need to give me all of your effort. You need to give me everything that you got. What did that mean? That meant that I, need, I expected, as a coach, I expected that player to go out there on that field, do everything that he knew how to do, that he'd been coached to do, to give his very best effort on every play. A lot of times, uh, people score because a player decides to take a, a play off. He decides to, to loaf. He decides that he doesn't have to give his effort in that play. And a lot of times that makes mistakes and people score points or, or things break down. And so every effort, I expected as a coach, I expected that player to give me all he had to be spent when he got done with that game. I believe God calls us to do the same. God says right here, make every effort to do what? To supplement your faith. He makes, a, he makes a, 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 an assumption here that we have faith. That, that we have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's what faith is, right? To believe in something that you can't see. To have faith in Christ. To place Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have to place your faith in Christ. Submitting your life to him. Confessing Christ as your Lord means to make him the boss of your life. He calls the shots. A lot of times we want to still call the shots in our life. We've got to confess Christ as our Lord, believing in our heart that God raised him from the dead. You know, I believe that there's a lot of people in our world today who understand the facts, who have an intellectual knowledge of Jesus. But there's a difference in trusting Christ with your heart, having faith in him. That intellectual knowledge of Jesus won't get you to heaven. Whenever the Bible talks about believing in Christ, John 3, 16, believing in Jesus, it's talking about that heart belief, believing in your heart. What's the difference? What's the big deal? If you believe something in your heart, it changes who you are. You can understand the facts without it affecting your life. God requires a heart that is submitted to him and believing in him with our heart because it changes the way we live our lives. So Peter makes an assumption that we have this faith. He says, make every effort to supplement or add to your faith. What are we supposed to add to our faith? Goodness. The first thing he lists is goodness. What is goodness? Goodness is moral excellence. Goodness is moral excellence. Choosing to do what is right. Choosing to do it when no one else is looking. To do the right thing. Moral excellence. Is, is the literal translation there. Um, and some versions even say moral excellence. We replace the word goodness with moral excellence. And so we need to be choosing to do what is right, choosing to do what is moral, what is right and good, according to who? According to God. Not according to our culture, according to God, according to the Word of God. And that's why the very next thing, goodness, to supplement goodness with knowledge. That knowledge there is practical biblical truth. Learning the practical biblical truth. A great place to start if, you, if you're growing in that is the book of James. It's filled with practical truth that you can apply to your life and live out. And so we're to add to our faith goodness, moral excellence. We're to add to our faith knowledge, biblical truth. And that means we've got to study it. That means we've got to learn it. That means we've got to read it. How many times this week did you read the Word of God? How often do we spend time with God in the Word? Not reading other good books. There's lots of other good books out there that we can read. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we replace the Bible with good books by good Christian authors, that's not what we're talking about. That's not what God desires for us. The Word of God, to learn, know the Word of God. So we're supplementing our faith with goodness, with knowledge. Verse 6, knowledge with self-control. Self-control is the ability to control one's emotions and actions and attitudes. Self-control is, is remaining in control. Of help, and, and we don't do that all on our own. But the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us will prompt us, hey, you need to stay in control. You need to stay in control of your emotions. And God continues to work in me as a father um, with my kids to remain in control. 
Sometimes that intense football coach that was in me rares up as a, as a, as a father, and, and I try to do the same thing, and I've got to use self-control to keep from doing that. Self-control, remaining in control of our emotions, our attitudes, and our actions. We have to remain in self-control when we get upset, when we get passionate about things. We've got to remain in control of our words, what we say. That includes what we type on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, Snapchat, whatever, whatever you use, social media that you use. You need to remain in control. And a lot of times we think we can type whatever we want to behind a, a, a keypad because we're not really saying it. Self-control in every area of our life. With self-control, we need to add endurance, supplement endurance. Endurance carries with the idea of bearing up under a weight or something that's coming down upon you. Bearing up under and carrying it and continuing on. Bearing up under the trials and the circumstances of life. So we need to endure. We need to have endurance. We need to have godliness. Endurance with godliness. And I, I mentioned earlier that a lot of times we think of godliness as acting, you know, the way that we act. We have to act godly. But I want to challenge you to this morning that, to redefine the idea of godliness. That godliness is, begins with a right attitude towards God. Recognizing who God is and who we are. And having a right attitude attitude towards God and if we have a right attitude if we recognize who God is and who we are and we recognize that it's going to reflect in our actions and so godliness starts with the right attitude having that right attitude towards him that results in an obedient life that results in obedience in what he calls us to do so we have endurance we're adding godliness we're supplementing our, our faith with then brotherly affection. Brotherly affection is a special love and concern for the fellow believers in Christ, for fellow brothers. And that doesn't mean just at Linwood Baptist Church. I believe that crosses denominational lines. I believe that crosses uh, financial lines. I believe that crosses um, ethnicity, racial lines that we should have a special love for brothers and sisters in Christ who are part of the family of God. Do you not treat your family differently? Do you not care for your family a little bit differently than you do than the people that you work with? I know that I, I treat my family a little bit differently than I treat the average person on the street because they're my family. They get special treatment. They get special access. Well, we're all part of God's family. If you're a fellow believer, you're a part of God's family. There should be a special love and concern there for other brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what we're to add to our faith. And then the last thing, brotherly affection, and with brotherly affection, love. This is the agape love that God has. And I've defined this agape love to help us understand that it's a choice. It's a choice to love sacrificially and, and selflessly. And if you think about the way that God loves us, and you understand that God does not have to love us. God would be totally just in allowing us, in choosing not to love us because of our sin. He could choose to do that, but he doesn't because he is love. And he chooses to love us sacrificially and selflessly. He gave up his one and only son to die upon the cross. He sacrificed Christ to die for us. He chose to do that for us because of his love for us. And this is the kind of love that we as believers, we need to choose to love others the same way. Not just choose to love our family, not just to choose to love the special people in our life or even the ones here at church, although we should do that brotherly kindness. But we should choose to love others sacrificially and selflessly. And before we go on to the next part, I want, I want, I want you to notice the progression or the order in which um, uh, uh, that he lists these characteristics. I don't think that these um, are the order in which you have to add them to your life. Because I think uh, sometimes we add these things to our life all at once or 
two or more, or, or, but I want you to notice the order. So if, when I, because when I think about this, it begin, it all begins with faith, right? It begins with our faith in Christ. And I, I began to think back about my life when I, when I turned over my life to Christ, when I became uh, right with God, when I accepted Christ into my, into my life, what was one of the first things I wanted to change? It was my behavior. It was my moral excellence. It was my goodness. So he tells us to add f- uh, faith. With faith, we should add goodness, the way that we act, the things that we do. The next thing he says is that we should add knowledge. So as a new believer, I began to change my actions. I began to change my outward because I knew my, some of my actions weren't pleasing to God. The next thing I needed to do was to begin to learn spiritual truth, to begin to understand God's word for my life. And so I would add to my faith knowledge. And as I learned about God, as I knew, began to learn about, he wanted me to have patience and he wanted me to have all these different things. And as I learned about God, I realized I needed self-control in some of my areas in my life. And as I began to have self-control in the areas of my life, different trials would, would continue to come my way. As you begin to try to practice self-control in different areas, doesn't it seem like it gets harder and, and trials start to come. So as Satan tries to put things in your life to throw you off, to throw off your, your self-control, which then comes the need for endurance. Enduring under those trials as they come. As you, as you begin to endure, God is faithful. And he will help you and undergird you and help you through some of these things that you needed to change. And, and as you practice that self-control, you see the faithfulness of God in your life. You understand who he is and your, your attitude of him begins to change because you know he's faithful. You know he continues to love you even though you still sometimes don't. Uh, practice that self-control like you should. You understand that he loves you. Your attitude to him, towards him begins to change and your actions begin to change as well and you become more godly. Godliness begins to become a part of your life. And then as, you, as, as your, uh, your actions become more godly, you begin to love on people more. You begin to understand that God wants you to do, uh, wants to love on others. And you begin to love brother, other brothers at church. And then you begin to choose to love others outside the church with that same kind of love that God has. Do you see the progression? I just thought that was uh, something very practical that we need to add. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours. Listen, these qualities are already yours if you're a believer. How can I stand up here and say that? Because God has given you everything required for life and godliness. If you're a follower, you already have these qualities in you. But notice that's not, he he didn't just stop there. If these qualities are yours and are increasing. We got to be working at these. This is our part, church. This This is us, that we need to be working on these qualities in our lives. Growing these qualities, learning to be in self-control, learning to have that right attitude towards God, learning to love others, having that brotherly affection, growing in our understanding of the word. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I don't know about you. I do not want my life to be fruitless and useless. I want my life to count. I want to be useful to our God. And if you want the same thing, church, we've got to be growing and increasing in these qualities. If we're not, the scripture is very clear. My, um, my major in college was computer science. And I enjoyed uh, uh, writing computer programs and telling the computer what I wanted it to do. And there was all, there was a, uh, one of the very first thing, commands that we would learn uh, was an if-then statement. You guys know this. This isn't, isn't complicated. But if this happens, then this will happen. If you meet these standards, then this will happen. And God has given you an if-then if statement right here. That if these qualities are yours and are increasing then you will not be fruitless or useless in your relationship with God. I want to be useful. I want to be fruitful for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to bring myself glory, but but, but to point the glory back to Him. 
Verse 9, the person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. I don't want to do that either. I don't want to forget how God has cleansed me, where God has brought me from. I pray that you're not lacking in these things. Verse 10, therefore, brothers, make every effort. There it is again. Twice in this passage, he tells us that we're to make every effort. This is our part. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do, these things will never stumble. If you do these things, you will never stumble. I believe he's talking about confirming our salvation. That these qualities in our lives confirm our salvation. You know, I, I work with students a lot of time who doubt their salvation. A lot of them will doubt where the, whether they're not a Christian, whether or not um, God has really changed them, whether or not th- that heaven will be their home. And this passage says that if these qualities are yours, if they are a part of your life, these qualities confirm your calling. If you are striving to live out these qualities in your life, that doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. But it means if you are striving to live out these qualities in your life, it's a, it's a confirmation of what God has done in you. Because all of these qualities are added to what? Faith. They're added to your faith. So therefore, brothers, make every effort to confirm your salvation. In other words, make every effort to add these things to your life, to grow in these things in your life so that you won't be fruitless, so that you'll be useful in your relationship with God. So I don't know what kind of decision that you need to make this morning. I don't know how this is speaking to you. The one question that I really want to leave all of us with as followers of Christ is this question. Are you making every effort to add these qualities to your life? Don't look around and say that person is, that person isn't. It's a question for all of us to reflect upon us. Are you making every effort to add these qualities to your faith? to learn these qualities, to grow these qualities. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to add the first quality to your life. You need to add faith. You've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior. And maybe that's the decision that you need to make this morning. But church, I really believe these are the things that we need to be adding to our faith and everything else to take care of itself. Are you making every effort? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. It's so clear to us in the way that we should live and what you have done for us already. So God, I pray that you will help us to add these things to our life and father if we're truly honest if i'm if i'm honest completely honest there are times in my life where i do not give my full effort and so for for that god i apologize and i'm sorry and god i pray that you'll help us to give every effort to bring honor and glory to you to add these qualities to our lives God, that they may be increasing. And sometimes we, we, we don't think of these things in the heat of the moment. And, um, but God, I pray that you will help us to have these qualities and to increase in these. And I thank you that you don't just leave us to our own, but God, you continue to coach us. You continue to empower us through the Spirit. And so, Father, I pray that you will help us to make every effort to be the people that you've called us to be, to bring honor and glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray.